I love the soothing sound of a violin. Father, we bow before you right now. And we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, because we've been born again, we have been made partakers of the divine nature. And so we thank you for the supernatural power that has been granted to everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, you give us an understanding of your word. You convict us of our sin. You bring strength and comfort and peace and joy to our lives. And so, Father, we rejoice this morning because in your goodness you have given so much to us just in the person of your Spirit. Father, we dig into the Word this morning and we address a, a very important verse for every follower of Christ. And I pray that you would enable your servant to speak from the heart of God that we would hear the word of God and that we would respond accordingly. Teach us, Lord, that we may be like your son. And we ask this in his blessed name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. And strobe light effect. We're turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 again. The chapter begins with an exhortation to walk worthy of our calling as followers of Christ. However, the problem that most of us have is that sin will often interfere and prevent us from walking worthily. The old self-centered attitudes and behaviors should cease when we come to faith in Christ, but unfortunately, often they don't. We realize that coming to saving faith in Christ, we become new creations, and as such, we are to live a new life. We have the Holy Spirit who indwells us, and He enables us to live the kind of life that God intended for us to live. And of course, with the Holy Spirit indwelling us, that is really what secures us in our salvation because Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 says, Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So every genuine born-again believer has the Spirit of God living within him, and we need to remember that. We can say that we are Christians, and we can even convince ourselves and others that we are. But if we are not inhabited by God's precious Holy Spirit, then the fact of the matter is that we're not really born again. Because when we are saved, we put our trust in Jesus Christ, and then the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ. The word baptism just means to immerse. We are immersed into the body of Christ. And his presence in our lives is the source of spiritual strength and life. And he is the power that transforms us, that gives us spiritual life. And he's the one who makes us like his son, like the, like the Lord Jesus. And Paul expounds more on our walk beginning in verses 17. In verse 24, I want to read this again because it leads into our text today. But it kind of lays the foundation for where we're going. And Paul says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed, or that word if could be better translated as since, 
since you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now because we've been born again, Paul explains here and elsewhere that the old man is who we used to be before we came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. The old man has been crucified with Christ. He is dead. And Romans tells us that we are to reckon him as dead. We were raised to walk in newness of life, and life in Christ has been Paul's theme throughout this letter to the Ephesians, and his key phrase is two little words, in Christ or in him, and you'll find it in this letter some 15 times. That is what signifies whether we are a Christian or not. You are either in Christ or you are in Adam. Before we came to faith in Christ, we were in Adam. And we were guilty as sinners before God. But trusting Him, He came into our lives and now we are in Christ. We are in Him and He is in us by virtue of the Holy Spirit. And this identifies our position in Christ and our oneness with Him. And of course, He is the source of every spiritual blessing. Every resource that we need is given to us in the person of the Spirit of God. Now, I don't know if you've read, there's a a revival that's going on at Asbury College in Kentucky. And I, I don't want to be critical of it because I'm not there. But I do see something happen. But we need to understand that When revival takes place, it's not all about emotions. The real evidence of revival is what happens when we leave. Are we walking in obedience? Are we in tune with God's word? Are we reaching out with the gospel? And when we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit who indwells us, that's exactly what we'll be doing. We have every spiritual resource necessary to walk worthy of our calling because we have Christ in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's a position for every Christian. However, there are way too many of us who don't always practice according to our position. We allow sin to keep us from all the blessings and our practice doesn't really confirm the position that God has given us. And that's why Paul exhorts us to put off the old man and put on the new, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. There's an exhortation, there's a command there. The command would be unnecessary if we always walked according to the new man, but we don't. And so in other words, Paul is saying here, stop doing the things you did before you were saved and start acting like the one whom God created and redeemed you to be. In verses 25 through 29, he told us to stop lying and start telling the truth, be truth tellers. Then he said, cease from sinful anger and practice self-control and a righteous anger. To be angry without sinning. Then he said, stop stealing and working with your hands that you may have to give to someone who's in need. And then last week, we heard Paul say to eliminate all kinds of filthy speech. Things like profanity and off-color, dirty jokes, slander, gossip, complaining, condemning, name-calling, lying, insults, gossip. 
malicious threats, harsh sarcasm, all of those things, those things that come out of our mouth, they are uncharacteristic of the new life in Christ. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so he says, if it's coming out of your mouth, stop it. Check your heart. What's wrong? Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. Your mouth reveals what's in your heart. Everything that is uncharacteristic of a new life in Christ, and we're to use words of grace to edify the hearers and to glorify God. And that brings us to our text today, verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now that little word and there in the Greek is what links it to everything that he's just said. But the truth is, I'm not sure that a day goes by that any of us don't at some time or another grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Particularly in a culture that tends to cultivate a what's in it for me kind of attitude of Christianity. So I want to answer a few questions to try to get a handle on this because it's very important. Because this statement is given as a command and it's something that we just can't afford to, to make a passing comment on. It's something that we need to understand. So the first question is, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? That term grieve is a strong word, but it means to feel deep emotional or physical pain or distress. It means to cause sorrow for somebody, to afflict emotional pain. Maybe there are some parents here who can understand what that means because you've had a child who's rebelled against you and has broken your heart. Then you've grieved over what's happened. You want the very best for them and you try to direct them in a wise path and yet they have chosen to go their own way and they end up encountering all kinds of trouble and, and then you're, you're saddened, you're sorrowful. Your heart is broken with heavy and heavy with sorrow. And God knows this kind of sorrow. In Genesis chapter 6, just before the flood, he said, And the Lord, said, was, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. You see, one of the things that we need to realize is that sin is a very painful thing for God. It grieves him when men turn their backs on him and rebel against him. He wants us to love him with all of his, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And yet, we don't often do that. There's another interesting passage in Isaiah chapter 63. And it's a reference to the children of Israel. And of course, we know as we go through the Old Testament, we see one of their patterns is that they were constantly falling into idolatry, chasing after other gods, rebelling against the God of Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they were continually being guilty of turning their backs on God. And, and so Isaiah tells them, I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. And he said, surely they are my people, children will not lie, so he became their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. And so he turned against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. In other words, he punished them but that word loving kindness is, is hesed in the Hebrew, and it speaks of his covenant love for his people. It would be the Hebrew equivalent to our word agape, which is a, a sacrificial, selfless kind of love. It's a, it's a love of decision. It's not based on emotion. But it reveals the great intensity of the Lord's heart 
when you love somebody so deeply and so greatly and yet they turn against you, that is what leads to a broken heart. So that's what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. Now secondly, I want to ask, what does grieving the Holy Spirit imply? And the first thing we need to realize is that grieving the Holy Spirit implies that the Holy Spirit is a person. If grief or sorrow or an emotion is an emotion, then it serves to prove that the Holy Spirit is a person because you can't break the heart of an inanimate object, of an it. I remember some time ago, um, I have these dumbbells. I've got one in this office and one at home. And every now and then when I'm sitting there reading, just to kind of, my muscles are getting flabby, so I kind of tone them up a little bit. And I don't do it as much as I should, but I remember one day I was walking in my study at home and I was getting ready to, sit at my desk and I accidentally, I was barefoot, and I accidentally kicked one of the dumbbells. Well, you can imagine how much that hurt. And I just want you to know that your pastor actually yelled at that stupid dumbbell. Now, honestly, it's not a good look for a pastor, but I want you to know that I didn't sin because I didn't offend the dumbbell. I didn't hurt his feelings because he doesn't have any. You can only grieve another person. I don't know if you know it, but there are some cults who do not believe that the Holy Spirit is a person, but rather they believe he is an it, that he is some impersonal force, that he's the power of God, but he isn't the actual third person of the Trinity. But the Holy Spirit has all the traits of personality, mind, emotions, and will, and you can see that all through the scriptures. And, of course, in a day when everybody wants to choose their own pronouns, I can guarantee you that the Holy Spirit says his pronouns are he and him, and they always will be. <clears throat> One of the most important things that we can learn about the Holy Spirit is that he is a person. He's not an influence or a force or a feeling. He is the person that came to indwell us. He inhabits every follower of Jesus Christ. The thing about this is, is that when we receive the Lord Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit in us, but I don't know if you knew that we also have Jesus Christ in us and we have God the Father in us. Jesus was teaching his disciples about the Holy Spirit, the parakletos, the comforter, the one who comes alongside. The word means he's one who is just like me. And Jesus is promising his disciples that when I go away, I'm going to send him to you and he will be with them and in them forever. But he told them, Sorry, I'm behind. <laughs> he said, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So it's really impossible for us to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit without also being indwelt by the Father and the Son. So when we break the heart of the Spirit, when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we are also grieving the Son of God and God the Father, because they are one. Secondly, it implies that he has a love relationship with us. How many of you know that when you truly love someone, it is possible for them to break your heart? We grieve when someone we love deeply has died. We grieve when a loved one has broken our heart. We grieve when someone we love betrays us. We grieve when our children openly rebel against us. But we don't usually grieve for somebody that we don't know or love. I mean, we can. I remember after 9-11, we were grieving 
for those who lost their lives and for all those whose hearts were broken as a country we grieved. But there's a, a love for our countrymen and it broke our hearts. Ironically, in other parts of the world, they were celebrating because they hated us. But we grieved because we loved our people. We can grieve the God the Father and God the Son because we know how great their love for us is. Charles Spurgeon said this, he said, all that can be said of the love of the Father, of the love of the Son, may be said of the love of the Spirit. It is eternal, it is infinite, it is sovereign, it is everlasting, it is a love which cannot be dissolved, which cannot be decreased, a love which cannot be removed from those who are the objects of it. It's the kind of love that we can never be separated from. And the grief that we cause the Holy Spirit is not so much that we've hurt His feelings, but rather the Holy Spirit grieves for us because He knows the damage that our sin and our rebellion will cause to us. He knows the harm that comes from it. He realizes that He knows that when we rebel against Him, when we grieve Him, then we are missing out on so many of the blessings that He actually desires to give us. He knows that we forfeit all these blessings because we allow our flesh to control us rather than His Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit didn't love us and passionately want the very best for us, He wouldn't be grieved. He wouldn't care. But he does. But quite frankly, I think a lot of Christians just don't give it much thought about whether we grieve the Spirit or not. His ministry is to convict us of our sin. And of course, if we realize that sin breaks his heart, it ought to break our heart. But sometimes we just plot on. We try to gloss over it. We try to justify it. We try to excuse it. And yet the Holy Spirit is all the time trying to prick our heart, wanting to prick our heart and bring conviction so that we will confess, repent, and get right with Him so that we can have that kind of restoration of fellowship that He longs to have with us. He wants us to love Him back because love is supposed to be reciprocal. But His purpose, I mean, we... we we come here on Sunday morning and we expect him to meet with us, but, you know, there's so many of us in this country who, who want the Holy Spirit, even like one of the, the songs that we sing, we want to feel good. Overwhelm me with your presence, Lord. Give me the joy and the peace and the satisfaction and the happiness. When the truth is, sometimes the Holy Spirit just doesn't want us to feel good. He wants us to be convicted and brokenhearted over our sin because he is brokenhearted over our sin. His purpose is to not, not to make us feel good, but rather to bring attention and honor and glory to his son, to the son of God. And to make us holy and to ensure that we really belong to God. He is the seal of our redemption. So let's ask, what causes the Holy Spirit to grieve? Well, we grieve Him when we ignore His holy character. We have to remember, He is the Holy Spirit. That means He's free from any moral defect. He's as holy as the Son of God and as holy as the Father. There is no sin in Him. There is no flaw. And as a third member of the Trinity... He, too, is morally perfect. And when those whom He indwells expose His temple in which He lives, when we expose Him to sin, then it breaks His heart. He grieves. Because the truth is, He's right there with us. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So whatever we do, wherever we go, He's right there. Remember the psalmist said, where can I go from your presence? If I go to the mountains, you're there. If I go to the depths of the sea, you're there. There's no place that I can go where you are not. 
And if you are a believer, he's not only all present, but he is in your heart. He's residing in you. The Bible speaks of his holiness and says in, in Habakkuk 1.13, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. And you remember when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the church? Peter confronted them. They sold a piece of property, but they lied trying to make the church think that everything that they received from the sale of their property was given to the church. But it says that he, they held back a portion of it and pretended like they were given all of it. And Peter said to Ananias, why, ha, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? And they happen to be the first serious object lesson of church discipline. Because they were both struck down. They both died because of their lie. God is holy. The Holy Spirit is holy. And he cannot tolerate sin in his presence. Which brings us to the second. When we ignore his holy presence... There's a reason why Paul writes this and identifies the Holy Spirit as the one who seals us for the day of redemption. And we talked about this way back in chapter 1 where he identifies. He says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That's Ephesians 1 and verses 13 and 14. Now, seals were frequently used in Old Testament times and in ancient times because it was a mark of identification. A letter or a document would be rolled up in a scroll and it would be closed with a, a seal of wax. And whoever the author of that message was, they would have a signet ring, and they would impress the, that ring into the wax, and it would identify that letter as to who it came from. That seal symbolized identification, authority, ownership, and security. And he indwells us to guarantee that our position in Christ is valid. And our redemption and our eternal inheritance are absolutely certain. He is the guarantee of our inheritance. It's, it, to guarantee it means that that's something that he'll never take away. We can never lose it. But when we choose to sin, we are deliberately ignoring his presence in our lives. And while we never lose the Holy Spirit, what we can do is interfere and break up the fellowship that we have with him. The relationship that you have with God, once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, by virtue of your position in Christ, you will always have that relationship. You will be a son or daughter. He will be our father. Jesus Christ will be our savior. The Holy Spirit will always indwell us. But if we allow sin in, we're grieving the Holy Spirit, and what we do is we actually break the fellowship. Much like if, if my son Tim and I got into a spat over something that he did to me, he's always going to be my son. There's nothing he can do to change that. But now the relationship can be not severed, but the fellowship that we enjoy now can be severed. And that's what happens with us, and God grieves and he convicts us of sin because he wants it to be restored. When we were saved, he came to indwell us and to serve, and he serves to minister to us and in us and through us. And Jesus said that he would never leave us nor forsake us. His ministry is to keep us secure from the wiles of the devil, from the weaknesses of the flesh, and from the wickedness of the world until the day of our redemption and on that day then sin is removed and we are free forever from 
the curse of sin and death once and for all. And he is an ever-present source of strength to avoid sin and to walk in obedience to the Word of God and give us victory in sin. But some of us act like he's not even there and we just flounder in the Christian life. We keep trying to do the best we can and we can't figure out what we're doing wrong. And the simple answer is, is that we're just not yielding to the Spirit. We continue to flounder and struggle with temptation and we sin while he is always with us and he's waiting for us to submit to him and rely on his strength to do what we should do. Now it's interesting that the word sealing and the word redemption signify the beginning and the end of our salvation. We are sealed the moment we're saved. The redemption, when it's completed, we are taken into glory and we are delivered once and for all from sin. But it begins when we trust Christ and the Spirit indwells, baptizes, and seals us as the moment of salvation. But He continues to indwell us. He continues to teach us. He continues to guide us, to convict us of sin, to comfort us, to give us understanding of the Word of God, to give us discernment over truth from error and right from wrong. and to empower us for spiritual maturity and growth until we come to the fullness of Christ's likeness when we see him. And John says that when, when he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. His ultimate objective is to glorify Jesus Christ by transforming us into his likeness. And I grieve him when I resist that. Then thirdly, he grieves when we engage in unholy conduct. We grieve the Spirit when we fail to put off the old man and put on the new man. And all these activities and behaviors that we had mentioned early, lying, stealing, um, anger, cursing. And then in verse 31, he adds a few more things, and we'll look at that next week, but he says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Well, why? It's because these kinds of things are uncharacteristic of a Christ-like character. Now, it's not mentioned here, but listen to what it says from verses 1 through 5, because... This is also included in the behaviors and attitudes that are unbecoming of a Christian. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And so we can include this in our list of behaviors that grieve the Holy Spirit because we grieve Him when we fail to walk in love. We grieve Him when we, when we give in to fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness, and that includes every kind of sexual sin and greed and idolatry. His responsibility is to shine the light of Christ through you. To make you like Jesus Christ, reflecting the image of Him so that any kind of sin that gives the Holy Spirit a reason to grieve. So, what are some of the consequences of grieving the Spirit? Grieving the Spirit is a serious matter. In the Old Testament, we see some examples of God's response when men rebelled against Him. In Isaiah 63, we read about what happened there when they rebelled against him, and it says he went to war against them. They grieved his spirit, and he withdrew his protection, and he fought against them in Isaiah 63, 10. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus confronts the Jewish leaders. And their constant rejection, and he said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her, 
How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus here is expressing his heart that's broken because they have rebelled against them. They want nothing to do with Jesus. They will not admit or receive him as their savior. John says that he came into his own and his own received him not. And he looked over the city and he thought about the coming judgment because they did reject him. Spurgeon said, what a picture of pity and disappointed love the king's face must have presented. With flowing tears, he uttered these words. He wanted them to repent. He wanted them to trust in him as their Messiah. He, he, he made himself known to be the king of the Jews, but they wouldn't have none of it. Besides judgment in the form of punishment being the result of grieving the Spirit, the Old Testament also tells us that he would withdraw his Spirit from them. Now, prior to Pentecost, the activity of the Holy Spirit in believers was a little bit different than it is after Pentecost because now the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. In the Old Testament, when God would anoint somebody for service, the Holy Spirit, he says, it says, would come upon him. And that's why David, who experienced the coming and going of the Spirit in his own life, pleaded with the Lord in his psalm of repentance in Psalm 51 and verse 11. He said, do not cast, away, cast me away from your presence, nor take your Holy Spirit from me. He didn't want to lose the blessing of God. Now, in contrast, King Saul, he blatantly disobeyed God, and he tried to justify his rebellious act. But the prophet Samuel told him this. He said, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14, it says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Paul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now today the spirit works differently. Because the moment we receive Christ, we are immediately indwelt and sealed forever by the Spirit. We need never question our eternal destiny again. Of course, it's always good to confirm it by looking into the Word and to see what the Bible says about what are the traits, what are the characteristics of one who says they follow Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that we are to examine ourselves as to whether we are of the faith. So we need to do a, a, a sort of a heart search every now and then just to make sure we're walking in line with the scriptures. But he'll never leave us. The spirit is always there. Again, we grieve him. You won't lose your salvation, but your fellowship will suffer. And you know what? For the one who is consistently walking with the Lord and something happens and he begins to grieve the Spirit and he doesn't want to deal with it, not only will the Spirit be grieved, but that's going to break the heart of the believer. No consequence could be more devastating than not to know. That's, that's one of the things that broke the heart of Jesus when he hung on the cross. Because when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All of a sudden the father had to turn his back on his son. He had always known perfect harmony and fellowship with his father. And all of a sudden, because he's bearing the sin of the world on himself, God, who is of pure eyes, cannot look on sin, so he turns his back while Jesus is paying the penalty. Not only that, your prayer life will be hindered. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Maybe some of you are wondering, why, why aren't all my prayers being answered? Well, it could be that this is the reason why. You're allowing something to, <coughs> to interfere, excuse me. Now, I don't want to presume that you have some unconfessed sin in your heart that you're just allowing to go on. 
But one of the principles for answered prayer is that we pray in the Spirit, and if we are grieving the Spirit, we cannot pray in the Spirit. And when I talk about praying in the Spirit, I'm not talking about praying in some unknown tongue, not a prayer language. I'm talking about being filled and indwelt by the Spirit and allowing the Spirit of God to lead you in prayer. But when you're grieving Him, you cannot do that. The third possible consequence is that you, make, you invite chastening. Just as a parent disciplines their children. Why do we discipline our kids? Not because we enjoy spanking them or putting them on in time out or in the corner. But we love them. We want them to realize that doing wrong is going to bring consequences, but doing right will bring blessing and privileges. God doesn't enjoy disciplining us either. But he does it because he loves us. Look at this passage in Hebrews chapter 12. He says, And have you forgotten the exhortation which speech to you, speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening or discipline of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So discipline is for the purpose of training, for training us in righteousness. And if a person can completely ignore the chastening hand of God and disregard the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit and receive no chastening, then the reality of what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is that he's not really saved. If you have no chastening, then he says you're illegitimate. You may claim to be a Christian, but you're an illegitimate son or daughter. He will chasten us because he wants the very best for us. Because he loves us. He, longs, he loves his children and he longs for us to walk in righteousness and unhindered fellowship with him. Bottom line, our most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And one telltale sign that we are truly his child is that we will not want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We'll not want to break our Father's heart. God is not saying don't sin or the Holy Spirit might let you go. We've already established that. He'll never let us go. It's not that you're sinning out of fear, but rather it, it's not that you're not sinning out of fear, but rather He prefers that you not sin out of love for Him. There was a committee of ministers in a certain city and they were discussing the possibility of having D.L. Moody serve as an evangelist during a citywide campaign. And finally, one of the ministers who was against Moody coming, he stood up and he says, why Moody? Does he have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And there was silence for a moment until one minister stood up and said, no, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. And loved ones, the Holy Spirit wants a monopoly on all of us. And anything short of that will grieve him. God prefers that we are continually aware of the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence. He wants us to be sensitive to how deeply sin affects him 
and us. And it's good for us to understand biblical theology about grieving, and it helps when we are able to feel God's sorrow over sin, but the surest way to avoid grieving the Spirit is to walk in the Spirit moment by moment. Understand that you are in a love relationship. So, walk in the Spirit and you not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, it's amazing to me how, how almost every sermon ends up with walking in the Spirit or being filled with the Spirit or yielding to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is, is the one critical aspect of our Christian faith. Without Him, we can't live the Christian life. Without Him, we can't please God. So what do you do? What can you do if you have grieved Him? Well, let me share with you an acronym. Cry. C is confess your sin as you repent and ask forgiveness. That's important. The Holy Spirit, His responsibility is to point out your sin. You know, when people talk to me about how much they struggle with their sin, that's a good thing. Because it tells me that the Holy Spirit is working. It's not necessarily an evidence, but it can be an evidence that they are really born again. Then, secondly, renew your mind as you draw close to him again. Again, that's something that, you know, when, when we repent, we change our mind, but we have to renew our mind. Those old way of thinkings have to be put away. We can't keep thinking the way we used to because the way we think bears out in the way that we act. So we have to renew our minds, get into the word, and let God fill us with truth. And then thirdly, here we go, yield yourself again to the joy of his fellowship. Now, if you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ, then the Spirit seeks to draw you to Christ. And he reveals to us that we are sinners and that we are unable to save our souls. No amount of goodness or righteousness or efforts on your part can save you. We can't make ourselves acceptable to God. I can't clean up my life. A lot of people think, well, you know, I, I, I've got so much going on, I have to clean myself up before I can come to Christ. No, that's not the way it works. You come to Christ the way you are. Acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you are dependent upon His mercy. But there's nothing that you can do to earn His favor. There's nothing that you can do to merit it. But if you will acknowledge that and repent of your sin, change your mind, and in other words, change your mind about the things that you used to do, the, the, realize that you can't do it yourself, that you can't be good enough. And confess that to the Lord and acknowledge that you need His mercy. Call upon the Lord and He'll save you. Believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sin that the death, burial, and resurrection was all done at Calvary just for you. God demonstrated his love toward us in that we, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I wasn't trying to clean myself up for Jesus when I put my trust in him. I realized that I was unworthy and I didn't deserve his grace and mercy. But if you put your trust in him and what he did at Calvary, he'll take away your sin. And in return, he will give you his righteousness. That's the position that we have. I now stand before a holy God, not in the righteousness of Mike Milliken, but I stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. It's been imputed to me. In other words, it's been placed on my account. And God the Father, who is the judge as well, will look at me and he will see me dressed in the righteousness of Christ. And of course, if anyone here 
would like to do that and has never done that before, then see me afterward. And of course, if you're watching online, then as I mentioned before, you can always email me at lbcdoulos at gmail.com and I'll be happy to get with you and share more about Christ with you and how you can know that your sins are forgiven and you have the gift of eternal life. But for those of us who follow Christ, I hope your love for him is so great that you don't want to grieve his heart. Let's pray together. While our heads are bowed, maybe you're thinking of something right now that might be in the way of you having fellowship with the Father and that you've grieved the Holy Spirit. If there's something that the Spirit would show you, tell God, talk to Him now. Our Father, there is nothing that I can do to convince men of their need for Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And if anyone is listening and has never put their trust in Jesus Christ, I pray that the Spirit of God would draw them to the Savior so that today would be the day of salvation for them. And for those of us who know the Lord, who have the Holy Spirit within us, Lord, forgive us. We often resist you. We often ignore you. And I pray that that our love for you would grow, that we would become so grounded that we would be more and more sensitive to the Spirit of God who indwells us. Father, we ask that you would do whatever is necessary so that your objective for us can be accomplished, that we can become like Christ. Father, we pray this together in his name and for his sake. Amen.